Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Swavik Zak. Uh, uh, I have a badge, so I'm not an imposter. Uh, and I would like to talk to you about databases. It seems like a not so much interesting topic. We have a beautiful day out there, so I hope not to bore you to death before the lunch. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's a good thing to start a presentation with a question, yeah, so to get uh, attention from the audience. Yeah. It's a stupid question, even better. Uh, you can laugh at it, yeah? Because even if you were Hans Reiser and you were sitting in a jail cell with your notebook doing nothing else but file system development, you'd still be using databases. Why so? If your notebook has a FreeBSD operating system, there are a lot of files uh, in a system that are actually databases. We, you, uh, we all know and like our CSV files, like password file, a group file. We have uh, databases that are CSV files that are basically compiled to a database format, like the password DB. We have the term cup, which is, if you choose to compile it with cup MKDB is as well, uh, our Berkeley DB. And of course, we have the file systems, which are nothing else than uh, the databases. They are hierarchical, are uh, networked in the case of NFS and other file systems. They have replication, if you, uh, if you know uh, Google File System, for example. Uh, and they have other interesting uh, properties that are um, good for databases, like atomicity for file creation, various modes of locking, uh, including range locking in a, in a file system. And of course, we have uh, XML files, SGML files. Our beautiful FreeBSD documentation is uh, done in DocBook in SGML. If you know uh, W3C standard called DOM, it is... Uh, pretty good in uh, accessing, manipulating, filtering, and modifying the, uh, the database. Drew was talking about the certification. It was uh, a pretty interesting talk. And I have a quiz question for you, yeah? So let's say you have two uh, systems, and your boss says that you need to set up NFS between the systems. And let's pretend there is nothing like ID mapping in NFS version 4. So basically, what you need to do is uh, synchronize the user IDs between the, between the systems. And there's one interesting utility, one utility in uh, FreeBSD that allows you to uh, perform a sort of a merge on the files. So we sort both of the files uh, on the user ID and try to find out which uh, IDs are exactly the same and which aren't. So the question for you is perhaps the, there's a beer as a prize, yeah? The question for you is, what's the name of the utility? I'm not Steve Jobs, so you can look it up. No problem, you can use the Wi-Fi. <laughs> there's, there's a single utility. That's, that's a pretty close to what uh, uh, SQL join does, yeah? Pretty much the same thing. Yeah, join. Join is the answer. It's, it's precisely that. Uh, so. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, data, of course. Data is what we are interested in, all of us. Uh, RDMS uh, data model, so basically uh, relational database, what it is, how it is accessed, and what are the uh, goods and bads of these databases. ORM is uh, object creation and mapping. Object-oriented programming is very important to us and has been for a long time now. Uh, so, some words about the vendors and the enterprise, a serious use for the databases uh, out there. Uh, what is good for NoSQL as well. So we are talking about w the world beyond SQL. Uh, and there's going to be some use cases for NoSQL. How can you use it for your benefit at your company or at your startup, whatever you're doing? Uh, so yeah, data lifecycle, it's the first thing and pretty important for, for the solution you are choosing. Uh, of course, we have collection of data, and there's a lot of that. Our data are collected on every one of us. Uh, we, we want it or not, but, but they are there. They are out there, and uh, they are organized, they are stored for undefined amounts of time. Uh, they are accessed, because we live in a networked world. Uh, they are replicated so that we don't f lose the data. If we need them, uh, we, we, we just need to be able to recover them from backup or, or just use the replica. And we are archiving the data. Many companies are archiving the data, not only to uh, you know, have, a, have a look back 
at the data right now, but maybe to analyze them in the future when the computers are faster. And I will talk a little bit more about that uh, in context of uh, our beautiful social networking sites. Disposal, I don't believe many people think about disposal of data nowadays because storage is getting cheaper by the minute and you can have a gigabyte of data that is way cheaper than a hamburger, so nobody wants to dispose the data. Uh, yeah, what, what we start with is basically the spreadsheet. Spreadsheet is a pretty intuitive and well understood model for, for organizing data for all of us. Even if we don't know what a database is, we all know what a spreadsheet is, hopefully. Yeah? Uh, it is universal and powerful. Many people store different, different sort of data. I have a colleague who is storing every fact about his life uh, in an Excel spreadsheet. So basically how long he sleeps, when he eats, how long it takes how much time he spends studying, how much time he, he spends partying. Uh, I cannot explain why he does that, but that's a true fact. Yeah? Uh, spreadsheets were the long, long before computers. Uh, actually, accountants and many mathematicians use spreadsheets in a form of a large piece of paper which has grid on it. And they actually, believe it or not, updated the fields manually the fields dependent on each other. So basically each change in, uh, in the field uh, made, made them update all the dependent fields. Yeah? Uh, Visicard was the first company that came up with uh, a brilliant idea of moving this model right into the computer, which made uh, Apple II at this time, because Visicard was uh, uh, developed for Apple II, uh, uh, a de facto business, business computer. Many companies bought it, because it, it made such a huge boost in productivity for people working over there that uh, they had no doubt that it would benefit the company as a whole. And they have a recognized access pattern. Uh, if you send an Excel spreadsheet to anybody in the world, probably, yeah, they will know what to do with this. So it's a really good thing because accessibility and uh, uh, intuitiveness of the, of the model is very, very important as well for, for the SQL databases. So here's a, a very schematic idea of what a relational database is. You have three tables. Uh, these tables are divided in rows and columns. Uh, and they are linked. The links are represented by the arrows, which you probably can see on the picture. Yeah, so you have uh, relations between, ta between the tables that let you perform a lookup and, uh, and, uh, and uh, mm, access the uh, results of a, of a query from the database. Yeah? Uh, the theory, uh, well, in the 1970, uh, Mr. Card uh, produced a, a, a really a revolutionary at, at this time paper called A Relational Model of, of uh, for Data for Large Shared Databanks, which was basically uh, a basis for what we know today as SQL databases. He defined entities that we, that we now all use, like a tuple, which is equivalent for a row in a table, a column, uh, a table itself, and a view, which is actually an ad hoc representation of a result of a query that, that you can access. It's a, a sort of a virtual table yeah, that, you can, that you can access that ceases to exist when you, when you finish executing the query. And uh, Mr. Cott came up, of course, with the normalization idea, which... Uh, uh, he divided as a way to avoid duplication of data in a database. Of course, it's a not too good situation when you have, for example, a surname of a person in two tables. And if you change the same surname in one table, you need to replicate the change in other places. Yeah? It's not a, not a good, not a desirable situation. So what you do is create this normalization uh, um, of, of a database schema that, that leads you to uh, well, more complex queries, but, but allows for the duplication of data. Uh, at some time after uh, the original database model was invented, came multi-access. At first, it was many processes accessing, this, uh, accessing the same database. Uh, then many networked entities, like users, applications, accessing the same database. Many issues arise uh, uh, fr from this, and uh, there were guys who were uh, started to think about transactional processing. Uh, so they came with a nice moniker, drug-related moniker uh, for, for this. It's called ACID, yeah? 
which, uh, which is four words. Uh, atomicity uh, means that a database is, uh, a transaction is basically uh, performed as a whole or not at all. So you roll it back if it fails in the middle. Consistency means that a database never is in a consi inconsistent state uh, after a transaction. So basically you move from one consistent state to another consistent state and you don't, don't break the database in the process. Isolation means that uh, if you have many users working on a database on the same data, basically, uh, they don't step on each other's toes. So one user doesn't see changes that are introduced by other users' transaction during his own transaction. That's this particular phenomenon is called phantom reads. Uh, so there are basically uh, roughly two uh, approaches to um, achieving this, this uh, uh, asset property. Yeah? There is lock and commit, which means that uh, when you are working on a data, you lock the data as you go along so that nobody else can read or write to the data. Of course, it has its obvious problems that if you have a long-running transaction, then uh, it's a bottleneck, yeah? You access the data, if someone, so, so somebody else uh, tries to do the same, they need to wait. It's, it's a no-no in many situations. So, so there's another model called commit or fail, where uh, you modify some data, somebody else modifies the very same data and accesses them. But when you commit, and you are the first one to do this, the other person trying to commit fails. They cannot commit the same data. So basically what they need to do is repeat the very same computing process to, uh, to enter the data into the database. Uh, there is, of course, the structured query language, uh, which is uh, a standard way for us to uh, access the databases, uh, relational database today. It was invented in the 70s by two guys working for IBM at this time. Uh, there is, it is divided into three languages, actually. Data definition, data modification, data query language, which allow you to uh, define, modify, and query the database. Yeah? Uh, there is the select statement, which is very powerful. And it's actually, in terms of Turing completeness, a complete programming language. So you can use it for anything you want, potentially. Uh, there are many things that SQL select can do, like joins, grouping, sorting, transformations. So basically, do, do, do what you please. Yeah? Uh, SQL is standardized. Uh, th there have been many iterations of the standard. The last one is from 2008. Uh, and there are, of course, many incompatible extensions to um, the language. Uh, what uh, do RDBMS systems get right? Uh, they are intuitive. They are based basically on a, on a spreadsheet model. Uh, they are well researched because, as you have seen, the founding theory was uh, like 40 years ago. Uh, there are years and years of solid engineering and a mature code base in most of the implementations. So uh, you are pretty sure that if you, if you are not doing anything very tricky, uh, then the, the, the database will behave uh, uh, correctly. And they are, of course, due to the maturity and many other reasons embraced by the enterprise, and uh, be it large or small companies, most of them use SQL da databases. Good thing about <coughs> mature technologies uh, is that uh, there are many open source solutions that try to uh, m m provide m the, the very same functionality uh, that the commercial ones do. So we have excellent databases, which we'll talk in a minute about that uh, give you a, a smooth path, smooth upgrade path from, from the free to the commercial and supported solutions. Uh, another thing is that it is easy to find programmers in DBA. So basically, if you are starting your own company or you are an uh, IT manager and you try to employ some people, uh, you don't need to explain in your job ad what is an Oracle developer or what is an Oracle DBA. Everyone knows this. So it's a really good thing if you, if you are out uh, for, uh, for some people, for your company, for your project. Now, there are many reasons for that. One of uh, the reasons is that RDBMS education starts early. This book over here, the cover of which you see, is called uh, Database, uh, uh, The Manga Guide to Databases. It's, uh, I have this book right over here. If you want to have a look, uh, you are invited to. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty cool book. It's uh, a part of a series, actually. Uh, I know two other parts. One is uh, a, a manga guide to physics. The other one is to statistics. It's, of course, a joke uh, of sorts. Uh, 
Uh, the thing is that we all have curriculums uh, of uh, relation to the database and SQL uh, in our universities. Depending on the faculty, you have uh, one semester or two semesters of, uh, of SQL. So, so you are supposed to know when you, when you graduate what SQL is. Mm. Something about uh, the database in the enterprise. Uh, good thing for, for the enterprise, one of the reasons why the enterprise uh, embraces the product is that we have, of course, a cloud of products uh, for, for many of the available databases externally provided by uh, ISV, independent software developers, that help you do the work that the original uh, uh, vendor doesn't, uh, doesn't do. Yeah? You have, for example, a Shareplex, which is a replication solution for, for Oracle. This is very low level, and they work closely with Oracle to, uh, to have it uh, provided. So, so it's a good thing for, for many companies. We have excellent hardware that takes into account the demands for uh, relational processing. Uh, some companies go even that far, like Hitachi, for example, to check the checksums of the uh, Oracle database blocks that lay on the disks. So basically, if you try to put a database block uh, on a disk array and it doesn't checksum correctly, uh, it, the, the write just fails. So immediately, the database knows that uh, there is a corruption in the data, in-memory corruption of the data. So you cannot write a corrupted block to the disk. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is good support in knowledgeable user base. Uh, people just know this stuff. Yeah, Fortune 500s like company uh, like technologies that are established. So so they all use it. They all have it, uh, and it draws. Uh, Big names of the internet, like Google and Facebook, submit patches to open source solutions. Uh, in the case of both these uh, companies, they do uh, provide patches for, for MySQL. So what's there not to like? So uh, it is all nice and dandy. So, so why, why don't we use it everywhere? Uh, well, database systems have, have a bit of a problem in some areas. Uh, one of them, if you look, for example, at Oracle, is that uh, they try to slop a feature after a feature to the database. I don't know what for, to just increase the number of items in the changelog. It's hard to say. So they have the XML processing predicates that allow you to put XML in the database uh, and, and process the, uh, the XML from inside the database. Uh, not to mention the, the Java engine, but I'll, I'll just do, don't go that low. Uh, three extensions, yeah, fetching hierarchies of data from database. Recursive uh, queries, uh, which were recently introduced to PostgreSQL, sub sub selects that are old and liked by, by some developers because of, I don't know, job security or whatever. There are many uh, incompatible supersets of uh, SQL, as I mentioned before. Uh, SQL uh, is a big language, it's actually a language, so it tempts you to put more and more logic into it. So recently I've been working on a project for data migration for a big company, and I have seen queries running for like 600 lines that were Byzantine in complexity, uh, absolutely uh, intangible and very hard to explain to anyone coming from the outside trying to optimize or have a look at them. Uh, you know about SQL injections, yeah? Uh, they are somehow mitigated by tricks like dynamic SQL, by uh, like uh, prepared statements, but they are uh, not available in some databases, and some people, some people just don't choose to use it because it is easier to just concatenate strings, build a statement, and throw it to the database. Stored procedures, of course. Oracle would like you to use the sort procedures. Uh, they would like you to, uh, uh, to, to, to have code actually in your database. It's not a good thing in my idea because uh, if you try to move to, to other uh, database system, you just need to port all the PLSQL, all the triggers and all the stuff into other database engine. Uh, when you execute an SQL query, you need to process it. So if you have a lot of queries, each of the queries has to be processed. There needs to be an execution plan provided for the query. If you have a massive update database, so basically many people are changing the database, caching is not easy because it is hard to track which records, are, which queries are affected by which records in the database. There are missing logic capabilities. SQL is not that complete when it comes to to logical predicates. So unfortunately, sometimes you need to pull more data and then filter them inside your, your application. Uh, 
the execution plan is static. What it means to me is that uh, if you start to execute a query, you cannot go sideways. So you cannot tell that, okay, this needs to be changed for me to get another set of data. You need to execute another query which has its overhead and so on and so on. Uh, long queries, as I said, are notoriously hard to optimize and uh, complicated queries are very hard to decode, debug and optimize as well. Yeah, so it's not a good thing. Mm. There's this thing called object-oriented programming that we know and like. It's the last silver bullet technology we have seen in programming. So by silver bullet, I mean that it increased productivity for some applications by, by an order of magnitude or more. So we should know this, and uh, it, is, it is pervasive. Java language, which seems to be the thing for the programming world now, is, is uh, of course, uh, completely object-oriented. Uh, at some point, when you, uh, when you work with the application, you need to persist the objects in memory. So you have this thing that is called object relational mapping, uh, if you choose to use uh, uh, relation, relational databases. Uh, so for ORM, RDBMS was, was an obvious choice at the very beginning, because uh, there, was, there was no other technology, basically, when you uh, when, when, uh, when you started with persistence of the object-oriented uh, systems. Mm. And there are a couple of issues. Uh, schema evolution, which means that if you have a live system and you try to uh, change uh, on class definition, uh, you need to add, for example, a slot. If you have this uh, RDBMS and OR, ORM mapping, you just basically you, you need to basically do alter table, which is a very bad thing for most databases. It doesn't happen often and causes a lot of uh, issues with the, when you have a lot of uh, data. Change tracking and rollback is slow. Uh, if you have long running transactions and this commit or fail model, uh, when you fail, it is hard to establish what has been fetched from the database. Yeah. So, so you, you need to put some extra bookkeeping in your, uh, in your ORM uh, mapping to, uh, to perform the rollback correctly. And it is very bad for dynamically typed languages, languages which uh, have variables or slots in this uh, object-oriented parlance uh, that uh, have a type that is to be established. Actually, the type is determined by the value that is assigned to the slot. So if you have uh, the nice uh, ORM model that, that tells you that this table holds, holds this object and this table holds uh, other object and there is a link between them, if you have some other typed object in this slot that was supposed to point to, uh, to, to our table, then what do you do? You cannot do this easily. So you need to do some decoding and encoding to, uh, to perform the mapping properly. And the encoding and decoding changes, of course, the select statements, which is a bad thing. Mm, there are many uh, RDB, uh, RDBMS vendors. Uh, uh, there is, of course, the open source crowd, MySQL, Postgres SQL, which are the best known. SQL Lite, uh, which is very nice for the planned uh, HTML5 local uh, database storage. Uh, nobody likes to have a database engine humming along with the browser, yeah? So it's a good thing that you can embed, actually, a database inside the browser. And of course, there are commercial vendors. There is this huge company which produces the presentation software that I have uh, created a presentation with. Uh, they produce a lot of hardware, they produce uh, storage equipment, and they do happen to produce a database engine that is particularly uh, popular, it's called Oracle. There's Microsoft, uh, of course, with the up and coming, according to Gartner database engine, Microsoft uh, SQL Server. Sybase and Infomix, I don't know if they are alive anymore. I haven't seen a Sybase or Infomix in like four years now. Okay, <laughs> good to know that. <laughs> okay, so uh, there, is, uh, there are commercial entities that, that support uh, open source databases. For uh, MySQL, there's SAP. They produce something called MaxDB, which is a version of MySQL. There's EnterpriseDB, which is a variant, commercially supported variant of PostgreSQL. The market seems to have crystallized. There are not many new database companies coming, not many new products coming, because either you buy Oracle or some of the other guys, or, or you just use the free software that is out there. It has excellent quality.
Mm. In a contrast, in a slight contrast, there is a, a list of just a subset of what we have as NoSQL databases. There are a couple of categories which I will try to outline in a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, there are many, many uh, mm, examples of, of databases that are just started now. Uh, they are not SQL, that's obviously uh, the other part of, uh, of the spectrum. Cassandra is an interesting project. It was uh, in, uh, initiated by Facebook, I think. Uh, then Google came along and, and uh, mm, supported it. Now it's, I think, Apache project. Uh, there's CouchDB, uh, which is uh, written in Erlang. Uh, it's pretty cool for, for developing uh, frameworkless uh, services, uh, web services. Uh, there are many, many key value triple stores, tuple stores, because uh, it's a very, very, uh, so to say, uh, old uh, technology in this NoSQL uh, world. It, 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 it was the way before. Uh, other solutions. There are graph stores. Graph stores and graph processing is the new thing in, uh, in many areas like uh, social networking. And there are of course object stores like uh, Allegro Cache and uh, Zope uh, DB. Uh, a bit about the types of the databases and what they give us. Uh, key value stores are basically uh, on disk dictionaries. They are persistent uh, pairings of, of entities on a disk. Uh, some database engines uh, of this type allow for extra operations like uh, operations on sets, uh, atomic increase and decrease of a value uh, in a pair. Uh, there are network and non-network non uh, engines of, uh, of this type, some are, uh, some are both. Yeah? They have a networking layer. A Tokyo cabinet has a Tokyo tyrant for, for networking. And as you can see in the I.O. section, uh, it, some of them are really good uh, performers. Uh, I don't know the hardware that it was measured, but uh, I would say that two and a f uh, half million inserts a second is a decent, and uh, it is very hard to obtain on a relational database. Uh, document stores. Document stores are schemaless entities. So basically, you put a document that has uh, fields. These fields have arbitrary type, arbitrary content. The, the, the value can be a collection of uh, the the content can be a collection of values. Uh, don't have anything in common. The, a document is a document. You you put as many uh, as you want. They they don't have to have the same fields. So basically, there's nothing like. Uh, like a column in the SQL database, you don't, you are not losing this way any fields. So basically, in some uh, SQL schemas, you see fields that are not used by by some rows; they are nil uh, because yeah, they are, they are not used, and uh, there's no need to fill them. They take up space, of course. Uh, the, these docu document stores uh, offer fast retrieval uh, uh, and uh, access in, and fast access to the, to the properties. Uh, there is a, a level up for the document stores. It's called super column stores. Cassandra is, uh, is such an example. Uh, uh, they allow you to uh, store pairs of values, and they have other higher levels of uh, generalization over the, over the concept. So basically, you have a super column, which is uh, a map of columns, a map of, uh, from a name uh, to, uh, to a value. There's a, there's a column of family. Uh, uh, that is uh, a generalization of a, of a uh, super column, which is uh, uh, an equivalent of, uh, of a database row. Uh, you have an arbitrary number of columns for a given key, so you don't need to stick uh, with, with uh, a fixed model. Uh, you can do writes without reads because the storage is column oriented, so it's not row by row, but column uh, by column. Uh, there is fast range retrieval because you specify how the values are sorted on disk, and they are actually sorted when they are written. So when you retrieve a range, there is just uh, read by read uh, access to the to the values. It is good, supposed to be good for uh, XML and for IDF. Uh, graph databases. Uh, it's pretty good uh, technology for reasoning. Uh, the, uh, as you probably know, graphs are nodes and, uh, and edges. Yeah? So 
uh, we store nodes and the, the properties, the values, and uh, we connect them with edges, which can be tagged. Um, HypergraphDB is, is a good example of such a database. Uh, fast node to node traversal, yeah, it's pretty basic. Uh, fast node lookup, so if you have a node property or name, uh, you, you need to be able to, to get this node quickly. There are set operations of nodes, so if you find a group of nodes of, with a given property in the other group, you can mm, perform a quick intersection of them. Uh, if you look at it, two nodes in an edge is actually, uh, actually an uh, RDF triple. So, uh, for example, Allegro Graph treats this database uh, as a storage for RDF triples. Uh, and object databases. Not many object databases are that good. Mm, I mean, not all of them uh, provide this rich set of operations. This one is based on my favorite uh, Allegro cache. Uh, uh, you have multi-version instances. So, basically, when your schema evolves, you have uh, objects that are older than the current set on a disk, and these are lazily updated as you access them. So it allows for uh, not uh, bulk updating the objects when you, when you redefine them. Uh, you have dynamic slot value uh, typing and linkage, which is important hard for, uh, with uh, ORM, uh, because obviously Lisp is a dynamically typed language, so you need to have different types uh, for slots and not only declare types. Uh, it has excellent ACID transaction properties, uh, long-running transactions as well, uh, it is integrated perfectly with the garbage collection system and has very good caching. It can predict which objects are uh, going to be used longer and which are just uh, one hit uh, uh, in, a, in a memory. Uh, advantages for NoSQL. There are many to choose from. Yeah? Uh, they, are, they have differing semantics. They have very fast instances, as you have seen in the uh, Tokyo, Tokyo cabinet uh, example. Good indexing, B, B plus trees, as well as copper, which seems to be the next generation, 21st century for the indexes uh, on databases. Uh, to enable replication and partitioning, uh, if you have some time, have a look at the gossip protocol, which is the protocol lying be, uh, beneath the uh, replication in Cassandra. It's a really uh, uh, interesting sort of a peer-to-peer -peer protocol that allows for, uh, the, this model is called finally consistent. So, uh, the data are not uh, synchronously on or asynchronously replicated, but there is a uh, guarantee that at some point uh, the, all the nodes in the group will be, uh, will be consistent. Um, they have great communities. Great communities mean good support on the mailing lists, on the IRC channels, and as well, they give a, maybe not guarantee, but, but some level of certainty, of certainty that uh, the database of your choosing won't, won't go away. They are good for startups because, uh, as, uh, as we have seen, many big companies don't use uh, other uh, technologies than SQL, and, and they don't see the opportunities. So it is really uh, nice to have uh, a database which precisely fits your, your needs, uh, the, the needs of the application you are developing uh, to work with. Good for rapid, rapid, rapid prototyping. prototyping uh, it's a bit of a tongue-in-a-cheek uh, statement that you can always go SQL. I don't think you can. When you, w once you go black, you can go back, as they say. Yeah. Uh, ideal fit for disruptive te te technologies. Uh, the big boys, if you, if you want to compete with, with big established companies, can throw money at a problem, can throw people at a problem, can throw hardware at a problem. But sometimes it is not enough. You don't have money for funding at the very beginning. You don't have hardware. Uh, to, uh, to, run, uh, mm, to run a lot of queries. So if you have a database that is uh, two orders of magnitude faster, you, are, you have basically upper hand uh, mm, in, the, in the market. Uh, we have 10 minutes left, so I would like to talk to you about some areas for, for NoSQL databases. Uh, here is a quick list of, of what it could be used for. Uh, Social networking, pretty big thing uh, at this moment. Many social networking sites, and uh, most of them are using NoSQL technologies of, this, of, of, of many kinds. Uh, mm, there is graph data mining, which is very important for these uh, sites because uh, they want to know who is related to whom and in, in what respect. Yeah? So they are, uh, they are basically doing this uh, graph traversal to, to know about relations between people. Yeah? 
Relevance is the king uh, because people have shortening attention span. So uh, the good thing is to, to show you interesting uh, stuff before you get bored and go away to the other side. Yeah? Uh, uh, interesting suggestions are very, very uh, important because uh, if you see something that is irrelevant or, uh, or, or doesn't uh, um, interest you, then you just don't click on the ad, for example. Yeah? Uh, hidden preference tracking is, is quite an interesting idea. Uh, some people are, uh, have studied, for example, uh, things that people don't say about themselves, like sexual preferences. No uh, site uh, like Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn will put a ticker in it uh, saying, are you gay? Yeah? No, nobody will do this. But the American scientists found out that your social circle, uh, with almost 100% uh, certainty, can tell you uh, if you are gay or not. So basically, you, if you have openly gay friends, then uh, it, and I think it's like 30% threshold, then, then you are basically gay. You don't say that you are. Yeah? And the good thing is that uh, you can present this sort of preference to the uh, advertising company, your affiliate. Yeah? The, the company can say, I sell this product and I want to be, it, it to be shown to the gay people. And it will be shown because I don't know that someone is gay, but Facebook definitely do, uh, does because they, they have access to all the profile information and all the updates for, for all these people. Yeah? Uh, some interesting info about the throughput. Twitter, Twitter has stored seven terabytes uh, a day last month. I have seen it in a presentation from one of the Twitter engineers. Uh, they have free uh, non-SQL uh, technologies in use, Cassandra, HBase, and FlockDB of their own development. So yeah, there must be something in it for them. Mm, that's an example from, if you haven't seen Facebook, maybe it's some, uh, um, it's, it's uh, explaining something. Uh, there's an, an update from, from my buddy uh, uh, with some comments in it. Mine is the last. Uh, I put a link inside the, the comment uh, and uh, Facebook can, can draw a lot of information from this. Yeah? If, if they want to correlate the data, uh, they can process the article itself. They will know what it is all about. They will know that th this is relevant probably to what the guy just said. They will know that I am interested in what he is, uh, he is writing. Another thing is that uh, there is this I like it link for each of the comments. So if someone else from, from the outside pops in and clicks, I like it, it means that he finds my comment relevant and is tracking the conversation. There is a lot of data to process. And I'm not saying that Facebook is doing this at this very moment, but they certainly will in this future faster quantum computing times to find out more and more about its users. Uh, case number two, the stock market. The stock market has a lot of issues. Uh, one of the issues is uh, sit and K or drinking from a hydrant or drinking from a fire hose problem. Don't try it. You can lose some teeth and you will stay thirsty. Um, uh, there is stock tick and news collection uh, and sentiment gauging. A lot of things that you need to process. In terms of orders, there is like 70,000 orders for Nasdaq in January of last year. It is a lot of orders to process. This, the companies that collect news information to, uh, to um, gauge the sentiment of people regarding a stock uh, tick, a general sentiment, a sector sentiment, and so on and so on. You need to take this into account. There are algorithmic trading systems that are very popular at this moment that actually perform the trading decisions for you. You just specify the program and they do it for you. What they need to have is low latency. It is a must, and I don't know if you have heard it, but there are many companies that provide this sort of systems uh, moving closer with the data centers to, to the Wall Street to, uh, just shove, uh, to, to just cut another half of a nanosecond from, from the processing time. I bet that if someone um, produced some shred of evidence that they can speed up the light, these guys would fund the research. Yeah? So, yeah, it is very important for them because they, they, they don't want to be outbid by, by other players. Uh, broad view and opportunity seeking. The, the more uh, uh, stock ticks you are observing, the more currency pairs you are observing, the more opportunities you, uh, you can see uh, in, your, in your trades. 
So if you see some low, low volume stock that, that is being processed, uh, that is being uh, sold uh, at this moment, it, it might mean a specula speculation attack and you can just uh, grab the chance. Uh, there is, of, of course, portfolio uh, valuation uh, with, with huge number of, uh, of stocks in the portfolio. It is harder and slower and uh, you need uh, good database processing uh, and good response times to, uh, to perform this efficiently. Mm, technical analysis and correlation all, uh, also important. Mm, particle collider data. It is a pretty cool example, close to a scientific heart. Uh, large Hadron collider, collider at CERN uh, has a four gigabytes a second stream uh, during collision. It is a lot of data, uh, and uh, as you can see, they, they store 15 petabytes uh, of, of this sort of data a year, which is a lot, I would say. Uh, why so much? What are the sensors? Chris Kenaway could probably answer the question. He's uh, a free business decometer and as well a physicist uh, by profession. Uh, what uh, LHC uses is files for streams. Obviously, there is no point in uh, installing uh, the files in the database. Prosimy pana Konrada Grzybowskiego. Za chwilę się zaczyna egzamin. BSD. The thing is that uh, the data set is partitioned of a, a large uh, group of servers, plus there are many da uh, data centers that are accessing uh, this data from all over the world to perform the analysis. So what you need to do is just uh, present the data in a usable manner for the scientists. So LHC uses MongoDB for, for aggregating the data in an uh, accessible and consistent manner. Uh, web 3.0, you probably have heard this new number for web. It's, according to some people, it's uh, what we have now plus geolocation. Uh, there is this company, Foursquare, that allows you to publish the information about your whereabouts. W what are you doing at this moment? Where are you at? And if your friends are nearby. Uh, there is new iPhone uh, that just came out, which has this wonderful thing uh, called background applications. And Foursquare can run in the background, of course. The thing is that Having this information, uh, they uh, can track your location all the time if you choose to, to do so. So it is a great potential for, for huge numbers of data. Even if they receive a tick every 10 seconds from the application, it's a huge number of data points that they need to consider. Uh, it's excellent. They don't have a, a good monetization uh, model for now. It's excellent for, for the geo-targeted advertising. They can say, for example, that you have been walking around and didn't stop for the last two hours. So probably, uh, if you haven't been eating something while walking, uh, you are hungry. Yeah? Uh, and rapid reasoning about the data, so correlating it uh, with, uh, with the information they have on the map, uh, is excellent for, uh, for bringing the uh, ads on point. You have one slide, okay? Two. Mm. Another thing is, uh, we usually have uh, air winter that is, seems to be gone right now. Uh, people are, are, are getting uh, interested and uh, giving more trust to the artificial intelligence companies. And there are many good opportunity, opportunities in this uh, area that just wait to be, to be explored. There's this company called Zanaris that provides uh, software that is basically graph processing software uh, for the police investigation teams. They used to build a, a Lisp system, that, but now they, they, they don't. They just find it more profitable. There is... Uh, uh, there is uh, a nice uh, area of road traffic analysis and management. By management, I mean steering the traffic lights, changing the number of lanes if, in each direction. That can greatly increase the, the capacity of the roads. Uh, IBM has uh, introduced such a system in, in Stockholm, Sweden, and they claim that they have uh, increased uh, in the uh, uh, rush hour the, the capacity of the roads by 30%. It's pretty interesting. Uh, bank fraud detection, correlating the transactions, uh, the amount of money that is being uh, pushed through the system uh, with customer behavior to establish that someone, for example, has stolen your card. 
Mm, decision support systems, of course, expert systems of all kinds, and RD of triple stores are excellent uh, for reasoning. Uh, frameworkless web development. Uh, CouchDB is uh, one of the databases that allow you to access the data using JSON and HTTP. So basically what you can do is have static web content that is served by a regular a light HTTP server, uh, all this fancy JavaScript stuff inside it and access the data directly from the database uh, without uh, need for any framework like, like Rails, Django, or whatever. Yeah? So you can, you can easily prototype your application without uh, having the framework at all. Mm. There, there are no issues for no SQL, just use it, please. Uh, thanks for attending. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Any questions? Uh, if you have a, a key value system in a <coughs> relation and rela relational database sy database systems, mm -hmm. is is um, isn't that the same thing as you have uh, with the is no SQL. Uh, what do you mean key value? You have like table with co oh, two columns. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing, yeah? Yeah, but is it, uh, is it the difference in speed? It's, I think it's a difference in speed. Can you insert 2.5 million records on your system? I don't know. A, a second, yeah? <laughs> it's pretty hard to do, believe me. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Next question. May I ask? Uh, my question regards the um, point that you mentioned, and I don't have the internet access, so uh, I want to use this chance to ask about the Allegro cache. Uh -huh. is, is it an open source project? It is not an open source project. It's a part of Allegro Common Lisp uh, okay. uh, development system. It's fully commercial, yeah. Okay. That's the question. Mm -hmm. Another question? If not, uh, thank you very much. Sorry for taking your time. <laughs>